I really sound like the very annoying kid, right? <laughs> well, it, since I'm unrevealing all my secrets, uh, one of the things I was doing as a kid was hiding. I guess like any other kids, but I was doing it on a professional level almost. So I was hiding all the time and I cannot count how many times my mother had to call the cop and I was just lost. I was just laughing my ass off. <laughs> I wasn't really understanding what was going on and then at some point I realized, yeah, she was worried. But yeah, anyway. Um, <laughs> so um, I hope you are all enjoying the day and you had a great uh, time during the conference. Um, I personally do, and so I'd like to thank all the speakers for the quality of their talks. Uh, really amazing. I learned a lot of stuff. Um, so I'm the last talk of the day, and um, I'm aware that I'm probably the last obstacle between you and that tasty Bulgarian beer. So don't worry. Or rakia. I don't know if you tried rakia already. It's really good. Watch out because it's pretty strong. I had one cup yesterday, and I was already tipsy. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway. Um, I had an interesting uh, topic to talk about, but I was worried you guys will fall asleep, so I thought, okay, let's talk about something more exciting. So today we're going to talk about Article 22 of the General Data Protection Regulation Law, or more commonly called GDPR. Anyone excited? Yes. Wow, I was really not expecting that, okay. <laughs> No, no, of course not. We are not going to talk about that. That sounds really boring, uh, especially this time you will all fall asleep. All right, anyway, um, my name is Edouard Shin. I am a senior software developer and I work at Shopify. It's my first time in Bulgaria, also my first time at Indil Balkan Ruby, so thanks a lot for having me. Uh, you can find me on GitHub and, uh, well, uh, I live in Poland, as you uh, heard, uh, so if you ever come to Krakow, we can have a beer together. We, we can also talk about GDPR if you want, but I don't know anything about it. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's start. Um, to, give a, to give a bit of context for anyone who has never heard of Shopify, uh, it's basically an e-commerce platform. We allow merchants to set up their online stores so they can sell the products online to anyone on the web. Um, there is no technical background needed to start your business, but until last year, you had to be able to understand English in order to start selling your goods. And that's because um, the entire admin area was written in English. So when you open your shop, you have to configure a few things like, like what payment providers you accept, shipping options, and etc. And everything was written in English, and everything was hard-coded inside our application. Like literally 99% of the strings were uh, just plain hard-coded strings. Um, talking about application, R is almost a regular Rails app. It's just a bit big. So to give you a rough idea of its size, here are some uh, statistics. So just Ruby statistics. We have around 2 million line of codes, more or less. Uh, around 120,000 unit test integration. And a lot and lot and lot of hard-coded strings. We had a lot of hard-coded strings. Um, the, the string were coming m m m uh, from a bit everywhere, uh, but mostly HTML and ERB, so inside views, but also inside Ruby files, so mainly helpers and controllers. Some hard-coded strings here and there inside JavaScripts. And surprisingly, I found few occurrences of hard-coded string inside CSS files. There wasn't many, but still, it was a very interesting discovery. So uh, today's real topic is all going to be about that. We're going to talk about localization. We're not going to talk about GDPR. Uh, we are going to go through the technical challenge we faced and the steps we took to accomplish this milestone. All right, so let's start. Uh, if you want to localize your product, there is a few key aspects. And the first one uh, uh, is quite obvious. You need to translate your product to be usable by uh, whatever the country your user is operating from. In our case, we had to translate the admin area, which was literally translating hundreds of thousands of words, if not millions. Um, and as naive or lazy as I was, I'm not too sure, uh, the first question I asked to everyone in the room was, can I just create a regex and I'm done here? No, it was, it was a bit more complicated. Uh, yeah. So basically, there were two problems we needed to solve. The, the first one was to create a tool to detect hard-coded strings that will be visible by the user, not strings that are used internally for logical purposes. And the second one is to stop the bleeding. So we sent an email to every developer saying, if you add new content, please, it has to be translation-ready. 
But you know, we cannot just rely on the fact that everyone remembers this or even reads their email. Who reads email nowadays? So, oh my God, this, this font is horrible. I'm not sure if it was a good choice. Uh, so uh, yeah, we had a time time constraint when we started the project, and um, we decided to focus exclusively on where the big majority of issue was coming from. So we decided to focus on Ruby files and HTML slash ERB. So we said, okay, let's not bother too much about JavaScript for now. Like the vast majority of strings are not coming from here. And well, there wasn't many things to do for CSS anyway. Uh, the solution we took to solve that problem is to use static code analysis. And the main reason is because we were aware that when developer wants to add content, they will d do it directly inside the HTML body or they will use a Rails helper. So for instance, if you use Rails and you're inside a view, uh, you will most likely use the link to method if you want to display a link. And it's the same if you want to display a button, a field, and so on. The first argument on the link to method uh, expects a string, and that string will be visible by a user, so it has to be translated. Uh, on top of the uh, regular helpers that Rails provides, we have a component library that you can compare with the bootstrap uh, Twitter CSS library, basically. If a developer wants to display a banner or a flash message that is uh, stylized the Shopify way, he has few convenient methods. And fortunately for us, that library had uh, an exhaustive and documented list of what helpers it provides, because there was quite a few, like, I don't know, a bit less than 100. Uh, and so basically what I'm trying to explain and to summarize things, um, developer were adding hard coded string directly inside the HTML body or through helper methods. And because we knew the signature of each method and what each argument does, then we could lever leverage that with static code analysis and add a violation only where it makes sense. So the tool we use for static code analysis is quite famous in the Ruby community, is RuboCop. Uh, the original author is somewhere here in the audience, so thanks for creating that. Uh, if you have never heard of it, it's a really great tool. Uh, it's a, it was originally built to enforce consistent code style across your code base, but nowadays it's used for more than that, and it can also check for coding convention best practices or even code performance. Uh, in RuboCop, there is a collection of classes which are called COP, and a COP basically defines what violation it's looking for. So this is a simple example. It's completely unrelated to localization. Uh, if you can not read it from the back, it's okay. I just want to show you that it's quite small. Uh, basically, what this COP will do is uh, it will check if you added a space just after a colon in case you write a hash or a keyword argument. And um, the cool thing about RuboCop is that it allows you to create your own cop to check whatever we, you want. And so that's what we did. For each helper methods I mentioned earlier, we created an associated cop. So it might sound overkill because we had to create like around 100 cops, but uh, for simplicity purposes, it actually made sense to repeat ourselves. And you will see in the next slides uh, why. Of course, every method uh, has a different signature. And to avoid false positive as much as we could, here are some cases we had to deal with. Oops, sorry. So the first case is quite straightforward, is positional arguments. We only want to add a violation where it makes sense. So in that example, it doesn't make sense to add a violation on the link or the div inside the content tag. We only want to add a violation to the text that is going to be displayed to the user. So we need to know what is the position of the argument that is going to be used to display something. Next is quite similar, but this time is for keyword arguments. We don't care about where the argument is, we care about the name of the argument. Similarly, but there is a catch, options that are passed usually as a hash. The catch here is that we need to check for nesting. So in that case, we only want to add a violation for the confirm key that is nested inside the data one, not the other one, because the other one doesn't output anything. And lastly, you have help methods that uh, doesn't really output anything, but they will yield an object that have method who will uh, output something. Quite confusing, but here is a concrete example. 
Form 4 in Rails. It doesn't output anything, but it has method that will. And in that case, we need to check if the yielded argument is the same as the receiver from the method, because otherwise we cannot really tell what A stands for. It might be an object that responds to the same method but doesn't output anything. And maybe you have guessed, we also need to, to deal with nesting or deep nesting. So um, on top of that, we wanted to encourage every developer at Shopify to help us write COP. Um, and we wanted to encourage people, whenever they wanted to add a new helper method inside that library I was talking about, to create a COP. However, to create a COP, you need to have a bit of knowledge about RiboCop and how it works internally, and we wanted to avoid that. So that's an example of a COP we, that, of someone that uh, created. And as you can see, it, it's quite short. I'm not expecting you to, to, to read it. I'm just um, trying to, to show you that it's quite short. So the developer just had to include a module, then define a constant and few method, and that cop will be able to check for this kind of code. So basically, it will add a violation on the label or help text if they're not translated, if someone calls the UI ready button method. And the violation will be only added if the UI ready button method is called is inside a form for block. So, Part of the magic is done uh, inside a module that each cop needs to include. And that module uses one of the best features in my sense of RuboCop, which is not pattern. So not pattern is a way to search for specific nodes inside your abstract syntax tree by providing a simple string. You can kind of compare it with a regex-ish. Um, the advantage of not pattern is that it's extremely flexible and it allows us to reuse almost the same pattern for every cop. All right, cool. So now that we're done with Ruby files, or at least we, we know how to detect hard-coded strings in them, uh, we still need to figure out how to detect hard-coded strings inside the HTML body, like here. That's, uh, fortunately for us, that's actually quite easier. So what we do, is that we read the HTML file, we parse the HTML with Nokogiri, and then we detect all text nodes. So here, hello world is considered as a text node. There is some edge cases where we don't want to add a violation if case, in case a text node is within uh, some HTML tags, like style, for example. Here, it doesn't make sense to add a violation. Um, and the tool we use to do that is homemade. It's called ERBLint. And it works the same way with RuboCop, except that it can handle HTML as well as embedded Ruby inside your HTML. So what Earbillint will do for embedded Ruby is quite simple. Um, whenever there is embedded Ruby inside your HTML, it will detect it automatically. It will strip out the ERB tags, and it will pass the process at source to RuboCop. RuboCop will run all the cops, return all the violation, and pass it to Earbillint. So the back and forth between Earbillint and RuboCops allow us to reuse all the cops we created for RuboCop to work for HTML files as well. Um, if you are interested in that tool, you can go ahead and use it. Uh, the repository is public on GitHub. So before we continue, you might tell yourself, yeah, that sounds cool, static code analysis, but it's not foolproof. And you will be completely right, because the downside of this is that we can only detect what we are aware of. So if a developer wants to add a helper method inside that library and that method will output something, he doesn't have a cup, we cannot detect it. However, that being said, we wanted to help our translation team not lose all their hairs and become bald. Uh, so we wanted to help them not to do thing, everything manually, basically. So if we're able to detect, I don't know, 60, 70, or plus, percent of hard-coded strings in our code base, we'll be able to consider our jobs done. Another feature we added um, in order to save as much air hair as we could to our fellow colleagues is to use uh, RuboCop autocorrection. So uh, in RuboCop, when you run the, the command line, you can pass it uh, an option. And when RuboCop finds a violation, it will try to autocorrect it. So what we did for autocorrecting hard-coded string, 
Well, first we detect it, and then we hard code the hard coded string. We put it inside a YAML file. We generate a key, which is a mix of the name of the file itself and part of the uh, key. Uh, sorry, part of the string itself. Then we replace the hard coded string with a call to iatn.t, wherever the string was, and that's how we autocorrect stuff. That also works for interpolated strings. The only edge case is if you have like complex um, interpolation. I think the tool doesn't handle it very well, but otherwise it's work okay. Um, yeah, so here's a quick tip since I just mentioned iatn.t a second ago. Uh, if you use Rails and if you are inside a view, don't use iatn.t. Prefer to use the T method that uh, Rails provides, it's a helper method. It uses iatn.t in the background, it just had, has extra functionalities such as marking your translation as HTML safe in case your translation contains any HTML tags or it will uh, wrap any missing translation with a special CSS class that you can customize to be like super flashy. So whenever there is a missing translation on your web page in development, you can spot it right away. One advantage of using static code analysis is that it made uh, solving the two problems we had in one shot possible. So our translation team were able to detect and if they wanted to extract hard code string uh, by running one simple command. And we block at developers from adding new hard code strings in the application. That's because when someone opens a pull request, we will run RuboCop on the code addition and if there is any violation, we will make their CI fail as they cannot merge. So next is about choice. We have to do a lot of choices in our lives, and here is another one you have to do. Um, and this choice is about what tool to use to translate your content. You will most likely have to choose between two tools, Ruby IETN or Get Text. Ruby IETN is the standard uh, library that Rails uses and supports. It's also supported in many other gems. The main disadvantage with IETN is that it uses translation key or aliases to store and fetch your translations. So this has few issues. The first one is um, it's not convenient, uh, it's a convenient problem. Uh, if you want to search for a specific strings inside your code base, it becomes a bit more complicated. There is some editor plugin that will make things easier for you, but still. The other problem is also performance. If you have a lot of translation files, like I'm talking about hundreds, if not thousands of translation files, it will take a lot of time for Ruby IETN to load them all, it had, because it has to read and parse the YAML. And uh, yeah, in our case at Shopify, we have more than 3,000 translation files, and at boot time, it takes more than five seconds to, lo to load, which is insane. Uh, and, uh, also, another issue, it's not really an issue, but keep it in mind, uh, Ruby i18 has to keep a mega hash of translation in memory, so memory usage also can be one of your concerns. As opposite, GetText doesn't use any translation key or aliases, and if you want to invoke GetText, you just need to wrap the existing strings inside a GetText call or just the underscore alias. I'm not too, too sure about performance since I never used GetText inside a large application, but looking at the main uh, GetText library in Ruby, it looks to be really, really fast. So in our case, we use Ruby IATN, and uh, I might have to disappoint you on the why. Um, there is no real reason. It's just that when the project started, we were not aware of GetText, so we jumped right away on Ruby IATN. Maybe we'll have to change at some point, uh, I'm, I'm not too sure. So, I'm not saying Ruby IETN is not good, that's actually the opposite. It's a really great tool, it will fit most use cases, it has built-in support on a lot of gems, a really cool tool, but at least consider your options. All right, so now we are done translating all our strings. Hopefully, everything are inside dictionary. It will still require some human work, but we have some tools to help us at least. Let's continue our journey to localize our product because we're far from being done. Uh, I found this post on Reddit and I found it quite interesting. Uh, it was talking about the Pixar movie. 
Uh, they were saying that they had to localize one of the movie inside out for the Japanese markets. And as expected, they had to translate the content, like the jokes and, and, and et cetera, in Japanese. But they also had to modify some 3D animations because apparently kids in Japan doesn't dislike broccoli as much as they dislike paper bell. <laughs> yeah. Um, fortunately for us, in web development, we probably don't have to deal, or most likely don't have to deal with CGI or even have to translate jokes, unless you're Aaron and you want to localize your puns, not sure. Um, but we still need to make sure that um, our template or design fits any language, because some languages are known to have very long words, like German. So if you don't uh, pay attention to that, you have a broken template. I'm sorry, GitHub, not pointing figure at you. I just found this example pretty funny. Um, yeah, so uh, one thing you can do to help your designers think about content length is to use pseudo-localization, which is a technique to test localization aspects of your software. In our case, what we did is we created a small gem that includes a backend that you can plug to the standard IATN library, and that um, uh, backend will basically hijack every translation call and replace all character of a word with a different yet similar alternative. So for instance, if you take that sentence, webhook saved successfully, it will transform to that weird sentence, but it's still readable. And the reason we do that is because, uh, actually, sorry, the, the characters we, um, we, re we use as replacement are UTF-8 characters, and there is few reasons for that. The first one is that we want to check if our UI works correctly with characters that have a various height, and then we also need to check if we have proper encoding support, and lastly, we need to ensure that the font looks nice with these kind of characters. And as I was just saying, uh, words lengths differ from a language to another. So to reuse the German example, Germans is known to have on average 30% uh, words that are 30% longer than English ones. So to simulate that, we doubled on all vowels of a word. And here is a an example of a very long word compared to its English translation. And if you don't know what ailleurs, chalon, sol, whatever, ectopper, uh, I've got you. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. Huh? I actually did some research on that. <laughs> so, so apparently this is a German invention uh, invented in the 2000, and believe it or not, it has a patent. So yeah, German engineering. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so let's back to our story, pseudo-localization. Uh, if you want to use the gem, you, you can go ahead and use it. The repository is public on GitHub. Um, okay, so since we're talking about UTF-8, let's talk about encoding, and, let, and more particularly about MySQL character set. So, sorry. So at Shopify, we use MySQL as a data store, but until last year, almost all our databases, columns, and tables were UTF-8 encoded. So, sorry, we're using the UTF-8 character set. So the problem with that is that MySQL UTF-8 is not the same UTF-8 as what, you what we are probably used to. For instance, in Ruby, UTF-8 characters are encoded up to four bytes. So if you type that in your ERB console, you'll see that it returns the number four. Problem in is that in MySQL, UTF-8 is encoded up to three bytes. So TLDR, in MySQL, you cannot store some symbols, like mathematical symbols, or some old char Japanese characters called antigana. And most importantly, you cannot store emojis. If you are curious about why or which kind of characters you cannot store, you can just Google uh, Unicode basic multilingual plane or just Unicode BMP. Don't worry too much though, there is a solution to that problem and a new-ish new version of MySQL introduced a new character set called UTF-8 MB4, which is the true UTF-8 you know and love. Yeah. And your customer will appreciate because they can use as much emoji as they like now. Uh, 
In our case, we had to migrate almost all databases, columns, and tables to be UTF-8 and before, and it took a really, really long time. So if you can, and especially if your application is relatively recent, I will advise to migrate if it's not already done because it might become more complicated in the future. Good news is, if you start a new Rails application as of today, or at least uh, or when 6.0 gets released, um, all your database will use the UTF-8 MB4 character set by default. So thank you, Yahonda, for doing this. All right, so to close on this UTF-8 chapter, uh, I will say that the more you are exposed to these kind of characters, the more you're prone to find potential issues in your application. And one thing you can do to expose yourself more to these emojis or whatever is to add test uh, is to add like some fancy emojis or uh, symbols or Japanese and Taigana inside your test fixtures. So I talked about about I talked a lot about translation, but not too much about localization. That's actually two different things. Translation is the process of changing an original language into a different one by substituting words, whereas localization is the process of adapting your content and application for local consumption. And the main reason you want to localize things is to appeal your customers' preference, local preference, and to avoid confusion. One great example of localization is the McDonald's logo. We all know the logo of McDonald's, this yellow M on a red background. It's used almost everywhere in the world, but some countries, especially in Europe, not many countries, uses the McDonald's logo with a green background. I will let you search on Google if you're interested, but that's what localization is about. So I will give you some real example of issues we find in our application that was related to localization. The first one, which is a true source of confusion, is date and time. So in the US, dates start with year, then month, then day, and it follows the ISO 8601 standard. However, some countries like Japan or France doesn't use that format. And things become even more interesting when you have a country that doesn't have a binding legislation on what format to use for dates. For example, Canada. In Canada, you can use many formats, and it's just super, super confusing. The problem also extends to time with 12 or 20 hour formats. And inside our application, almost all our date and time were not localized, and they were just using the ISO 8601 way of formatting dates. So we had to modify that to use the country's specific way of displaying date and time. Another example is for the start of the week. I don't know if you noticed in Google Calendar, based on your user's preference, the start of the week will be different. In the US, it will start on a Sunday, whereas in France, it will start on a Monday. That's a problem in your application if you use a feature that relies on the first day of the week. So you need to make sure you know the first day of the week if you want to implement that feature, and a calendar is a good example. So last but not least, uh, let's talk about address formats. And I need to tell you a, a quick personal story. So when I was living in Canada, that, that was my address. I don't live here anymore, so I don't care about privacy or giving you my address. Um, this was uh, 902 for the apartment number, then 210 Gloucester Street for the street, Ottawa City, ON Ontario for the province, K2P2K4 for the postal code. Cool. The problem is that my bank in France needed to send me a letter and their great system from the 70s or 60s, I don't know, decided that my address was not valid. And so instead of, I don't know, not sending the letter at all or just call me for precision, they decided to strip away every part of the address which was not formatted the French way. So no kidding, they removed the 902210 Gloucester Street part because, well, it's not correctly formatted in France, especially the 902210. Of course, they removed the Ontario part because we don't have a notion of province in France. So basically, I was left with my first name and last name, which is completely uh, useless because in Canada, we don't put name on mailboxes. I was left with Ottawa and the postal code, and they were kind enough at least to put the country. <laughs> yeah. So uh, 
Long story short, don't hard code format inside your application. Like don't format uh, address format, for instance. And uh, I see you guys are all in suspense about what happened to the love letter sent by my bank. So I received it. It's just that I'm super lucky and the postal code, you can look on Google Map if you want, it just maps exclusively to my building, which is a super tiny building, but you know, Canadian stuff, I don't know what they do that, so, yeah. Um, anyway, so to solve that address uh, formatting problems, we decided to gather da data uh, for various countries of the world, many countries, and we put that inside YAML files. On top of this data, we also added some other stuff like the uh, start day of the week or like what's the way of formatting phone numbers and so on and so on. And we created an endpoint so that all our application could retrieve this data from a centralized place. If you are interested in this, we also created a small NPM package which will make a GraphQL query to that endpoint and will, will, and will return you a formatted address for the country you need. The NPM package is just here. So to close this talk and to go have Rakia all together, uh, localization challenges just don't stop with words. Phone number, address formatting, geography, maps, every aspect of your UX needs to be inspected with international uh, aspects in mind. The international, internationalization and globalization of a platform is very difficult. It's not an easy task. It's an ongoing effort. And the same as security expert never sleeps, expect to always be around and teach your peer about language specificities or um, locals requirements or market subtleties. Thank you very much.